Hi, I'm Marianne Lee. I'm going to do a reading from my novel, A Quiet Tide, published by New Island. In this section, the year is 1803. Ellen Hutchins is 18 years of age and she's come to live with Whitley Stokes, his wife Louise and their many children. Whitley Stokes is a physician and botanist and he's taking the family on a day trip to Hope. September, a last blast of warm weather. A sand-like dust from the street infiltrated the front rooms, even with the windows closed, and was carried on slipper soles and hands to the rest of the house. Louise scolded the servants, despairing over her wallpaper and upholsteries. The children complained of ticklish throats, stinging eyes. For respite, Dr Stokes promised a Sunday outing. After early service in St Andrews, they prepared to head away. First, a fuss over who would sit where, who would take the baby, the picnic. At last, Dr Stokes, Minnie and Harriet climbed into the first carriage. Louise, Ellen, Charles, Dunn and a young man servant, Peter, into the second. From the church, they turned for College Green. Ellen had a new bonnet of straw that blocked her view to the left and right like the blinkers of a horse. She strained her neck as far as she could. Fine buildings lined the wide streets. Well-dressed gentlemen and ladies, some garish in bright colours, strolled the paths. As soon as the carriages slowed, ragged men, women and children materialised from the alleys, holding out dirt-caked, pleading hands. Please, young miss, we're starving. Get away, Peter raised a stick. The driver urged the horse on. The last thing Ellen saw as they lurched forward was a tiny infant, no more than a scrap, clinging to its mother's ragged bosom. She shrank back, glad for once of the curved wings that shielded her face. From the centre to the outskirts, the fine buildings thinned out, replaced by desolate spaces, cobbled or covered with patchy grass. Dogs and pigs roamed, urinating and defecating freely. Dunghills steamed in the sun. Louise held the end of her shawl over her face and Ellen did the same, the stench overwhelming. Now they passed a row of cottages with well-tended front gardens and lines of washing flapping in the breeze. Barefoot children scampered about. Soon the straggling outskirts merged into countryside and thick hedgerows lined the road, high with grasses and poppies, Queen Anne's lace, ox-eye daisies. The horses clipped on at a steady pace through clouds of midges and horseflies. They're drawn by the horse's sweat, ma'am, Peter said, sweet as sugar it is to them. His voice was respectful, his quick glance at Louise, furtive and sly. She seemed not to hear him, waving her hand in front of her face. Moisture coated her upper lip. Damp patches had spread under Ellen's armpits, her thighs itched against the leather seat. The sea! Harriet stood in the leading carriage, gawking for a better view and holding on to her straw hat, almost falling out as the carriage rocked over a rut in the road. Dr Stokes pulled her back down. The sea, the sea, Minnie echoed. The road now clung to the coast and the great curve of Dublin Bay came into view. In the distance, low hazy hills covered in yellow and purple vegetation fell towards the sea. Across the bay, tall ships streamed into Dublin Harbour, white sails stark against the blue, while fishing boats bobbed about closer to shore. The sea churned with breakers in the stiff breeze. At the village of Plantarf, no more than a shambling cluster of cottages, bathing machines had been pushed into the tide, though they didn't appear to be in use. An old man sucking on a pipe waved from his seat on the sea wall. Lovely, is it not? Louise sounded half asleep. I was born beside the sea, Ellen said. Yes. But you're more used to city ways now. 
I know nothing of city ways. We must take you out more. You're young and should meet other young people. Ellen had a sudden vision of being delivered from salon to salon to drink tea and gossip. She would stutter hopelessly. She had none of Caroline's talent for chatter. And her clothes, plain, without lace, ribbons, beading or embroidery. I prefer quiet occupations, she said. Too quiet, Louise said. Dr Stokes is impressed with how you're working your way through his library. But think, when I was your age, I enjoyed going out in society. Where else would I have met Dr Stokes? She fanned herself with the edge of her shawl. Though I little thought then that I'd have to compete with plants for a husband's attention. How long has Dr Stokes been interested in botany? Since he was a boy. But I would not refer to it as an interest, rather an obsession such as men frequently have. Horses, music, Italian poetry, naval battles. They apply their fervent minds to something other than the everyday business of living and dying, which is all women have to occupy them. Perhaps because of his profession, Dr Stokes takes comfort in all that's green and alive, Ellen said. Louise gave her one of her looks, not quite affronted, alert to the possibility of affront. He plucks plants from the fields and forests where God placed them, crushes them into dry scraps, stares at them for hours under his microscope as if they held the meaning of life itself. Rousseau says that nature, Louise's nostrils flared, a warning, too late to stop. He says that nature abates the taste for frivolous amusements, prevents the tumult of the passions and provides the mind with a nourishment which is salutary by filling it with an object most worthy of its contemplations. She blushed. Or words to that effect. My mind is already full of objects worthy of my contemplations, Louise said. The dinner menu, Charles's rash, the need for a new butcher, of course, ma'am, it must be difficult. I suppose you can't be blamed for being young and naive. You'll soon learn that books will not help you escape life. Mine has been hard, but I don't complain. What's the use? What cannot be changed must be born with grace. Ellen thought, life with nothing beyond domestic cares would soon prove intolerably dull for man or woman. Louise, at least, had her cosseted children. She said none of this, however, only nodded in sympathy. So that's from A Quiet Tide, published by New Island and available soon.